You are listening to audio from the Decidedly Podcast. This episode is a highlight clip from this week's full episode. To listen in on the complete conversation, see the show notes for the link to the complete show. You can help us out by leaving us a five-star review wherever you listen to podcasts. We appreciate every bit of your support. I'm Morgan McKittrick, your producer, and this is Decidedly. But what do you think is the biggest key for people to manage their money and, and maybe even wealthy people to manage their money without losing who they are and without veering off track? So I encourage, and this again is part of what I do when I talk to groups about this, and I've been doing this all over the world really for years. So there's this thing called an ethical will. It dates back a thousand years to the 11th century. Uh, Jews created ethical wills, which were parallel documents to their material wills. Most of your clients, I would bet all of your clients have an estate plan. I'll bet almost none of them have a corollary document, ethical will, or legacy letter to their loved ones about, about the values they want to bequeath to them. So I I have a program a process. I there's a book called For You When I Am Gone, which is about this, and I'm not hawking my book. I'm answering your question, honestly. Yeah. It's a series of 12 questions to ask yourself and answer for yourself truthfully to create the story of your life that you want to bequeath to the people you love when you're gone. Now, when you do that, it's doing two things. First of all, it is avoiding what happens in most families, which is the last word most people ever leave for their loved ones. The final thing your kids hear from from you for most people is a legalese document written by someone who barely knew you that is entirely about who gets what and when and how much, as if somehow the material will express the spiritual yeah. and the emotional, right? That's your final word to your kids? Really? Who gets the stuff? Yeah. Yeah. Right. And nobody wants your crap anyway, honestly. Right. They don't want the paperweights or the pen collection or the whatever. They don't care. So what do I want? What do I have? What do I miss about my dad? I mean, one of the saddest images in my brain is of going down into the basement of my parents' townhouse after my dad died. My mom said, Stephen, go downstairs and take anything of dad's you want. And my father's stuff was in a heap on the floor. But that wasn't his legacy. So when you create this document, your, your final words to your loved ones when you're gone are really the treasures they really want and need, the things that will nurture and sustain them. That's number one. But if you do this thing now, you're also creating the truth you say you live by, and you get to hold that sort of MRI of your inner life up to the light and ask yourself, what I think is the most important question any human being can ask, which is, this is what I say my truth is. This is what I say I believe and and have lived and died for my whole life. Am I living it? Or is my life mostly pretend? That's a powerful question for your clients. Because then what you get to do in terms of advising your clients about their money is, okay, this is your truth. Now let's look at your checkbook and see if it's aligned with your truth. Yeah. So so I work with a lot of people on, on looking at building legacy plans like that, like, like what you've talked about. And when we look at transferring values on to the next generation, transferring those values to the people that you, you know and care about. One of the ways that we can do that is through our philanthropy, through that final document to say, I, you know, I bequeath this to this cause, this, uh, this charity, this organization that reflects my values. Yep. Are there, are there other ways that you're thinking that, that people can do that, that can be as effective? Yes. What do you do with your time? how did you spend your time with your loved ones? Were you serving Thanksgiving dinner at a shelter? 
Were you uh, visiting places where there are poor people and exposing your children to the world? Now, the sentence I'm about to utter, I know sounds ridiculous, but I'm going to say it anyway, because you guys are in the business, you'll understand. The hardest working billionaire I know, and the most thoughtful billionaire philanthropist I know, I asked him one time, I said, how did you turn out this way? And he said, my father had me at the family philanthropy table when I was five years old. And if I didn't understand something that was happening, he would stop the entire meeting and explain it to me. Mm. So modeling while you're alive, it's not so much what you give when you're dead that will teach your loved ones or bequeath something to your loved ones. It will help in the world, of course. But you should be living, live the way you die and die the way you live. So it's, it's action. It's, it, were you writing checks when you were 30, 35, 40, 45? Did your kids give a third of their allowance away? Did they earn that allowance? Uh, you know, it's, have you raised your children to understand the difference between need and want? Even if, especially if, you can afford whatever they want and they're going to roll their eyes. It's a challenge when your kids know you can afford whatever they want. How do you it's, raise it's a, a It's a challenge with kids who want, you know, the latest and greatest and they want what they want when they want it. Yes. But also living in an environment like you were talking about earlier, living in, in L.A., where all of their friends have something that they want to be a part of. They want to be part of the group. They want to feel valued and and have esteem in their social circle. And it's hard to say no. Um, yeah, I remember one of the things that that we did when when our kids were growing up is, you know, Sanger knows this well. I said, you get you gotta earn and pay for your first car. And you you did that. I, I know you, you didn't probably you would have preferred to sort of have one handed to you, but not a, at the time that would have been cooler, but <laughs> driving that old beat up Jeep Wrangler was pretty sweet. And you yeah. felt good, about it, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I immediately had, uh, I immediately felt sad for my friends that just got like a new Range Rover. Like, oh dude. Did like, you really, did you at the time? You yeah. 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 Like once I went before I got my car, I was like, oh, that'd be cool. And then as soon as I got mine, and I see them with theirs. It's like, oh, dude, that's not even your car. This yeah, one's mine. That's, that's right. That's right. And so it's a good example of, you know, this want versus need. And this idea of material things having real value and spiritual value. Or saying anything about who you are. These are things that you can start very early on. And... You know, it's amazing to me that parents, if their kid comes home from kindergarten and, and, and tells them an incredibly racist joke, parents will engage with that child and talk about it and educate that child. If a child comes home and says something incredibly sexist to his mother, which my kid tried when he was five years old, He's going to get educated. But when a kid comes home and says, Daddy, um, Joey's daddy has 10 cars. You know what parents say? Nothing. Or they celebrate it. Really? That's incredible. Oh, they must be so rich. What kind of cars are they? We don't want to engage when it comes to materialism because it's the last allowable ism in our culture. And I don't understand why that is. Well, I do. I do understand that if I engage with my daughter or son about sexism or racism or any other ism other than materialism, I'm, I'm not risking judgment from others. But if I engage with my daughter when she comes home and talks about the 10 cars and I say, Hannah, let me ask you something. How many cars can a person drive at one time? One daddy. Okay, let's 
let's think about how much money nine other cars cost. And let's think about how many homeless people could we feed with that money? Well, I don't know a lot, daddy. Yeah. Now what's the risk? The risk is Hannah's going to go back to kindergarten the next day and she's going to say, Joey, my daddy thinks your daddy has bad values. Okay. <laughs> that's the risk. That's the risk. Why am I willing? Why are parents willing to take that risk with sexism or racism or homophobia? But they're not willing to take that risk with crass materialism. And I know what you're thinking. What you're thinking is, but Rabbi, how do we, who are we to judge? I mean, maybe, maybe Joey's daddy gives millions every year to charity. So give him his 10 cars. Who cares? I agree with you that it's not a clear line. But I also know it's like it's like what Justice Potter Stewart said about when he was asked by the Supreme Court to define obscenity. Uh, it was a pornography case. Was this film art mm -hmm. or was it obscene? And Justice Potter Stewart said, I can't define it, but I know when I see it. So you may not be able to define what's over the line, but you know when you see it. And if you're not engaging with your kids about that, or your grandchildren about that, you are setting them up on a dangerous path. Thanks for making the great decision to listen in to this week's episode highlight. If you want more of what you just heard, see the show notes for the full episode. As always, for the latest decision-making tips, find us on decidedlypodcast.com or on Instagram at decidedlypodcast. And be sure to sign up for our weekly newsletter from the link in the show notes. Don't forget to leave us a five-star review as well. We read all of your comments, so if you learned some decision-making tips today, let us know. Until next time, this is Decidedly. Insights, advice, and comments provided by Sean Smith, Sanger Smith, and speakers identified as part of the Decidedly podcast should not be considered recommendations. Speakers not identified as members of Decidedly are expressing their opinion, and their statements should not be construed as reflecting the views of the Decidedly team. This podcast is produced solely for informational purposes, not personalized advice.